head for the markets eventually. And if I look back just six months ago, a lot of industry luminaries, whether we think about guys like Ray Dalio, Stan Druckenmiller, Carl Icahn, these guys were all casting bearish views for a lot of the same reasons that you and I were. Then Donald Trump was elected president, and suddenly all of these guys turned super bullish. Ray Dalio seems to be backing away from that enthusiasm in the last week or two. But the fact remains that some super talented people all turned bullish super bullish after the election forgive me jim i'm just not seeing the logic to this are you well yes and no mr trump has said he's going to do some wonderful things he's going to cut taxes which is always great for any society any country he said he's going to rebuild the infrastructure which america desperately needs and is good for america he says he's going to bring home the three trillion dollars u.s dollars which American companies have overseas. All of these things are wonderful, wonderful things. And if he can do it, Eric, wow, things are going to be great. But Mr. Trump has also said he's going to have trade war with China, Mexico, Japan, Korea, a few other people that he has named. He swore that on his first day in office, he would impose 45 percent tariffs against China well, he's been there three weeks, two or three weeks, and he hasn't done it yet, but uh, he's still got it in his head, I'm sure. Uh, maybe he's just another politician like all the rest of them. He says one thing, it doesn't mean it at all, but he does have at least three people in high levels in his uh, group who are very, very keen to have trade wars with China and other people. If he does that, Eric, it's all over. I mean, history is very clear that... Trade wars always lead to problems, often to disaster, sometimes even to real war, shooting war. So uh, I don't know. I'm not sure Mr. Trump knows. He said so many things, and many of the things are contradictory. Now, if he's not going to have trade wars with various people, then chances are for a while, happy days are here. When we spoke last year, you anticipated even more strength for the U.S. dollar. And as is usually the case, the market has proven you right. But you were careful to say that it's not because the true fundamentals were bullish, but rather you went out of your way to emphasize that people would continue to buy dollars because they didn't know what else to do. And you thought that it could even turn into a bubble. So how have your views evolved a year later? Do you still think the dollar has much higher to go? And if so, how much higher from here? Well, I still own the dollar. The dollar, fortunately, is having a, a, a correction now. You know, all bull markets need corrections. Corrections are good. Uh, I haven't sold any. I may have even bought more, for all I know. No, I still see the same thing, that whatever happens in the world, there is going to be some turmoil somewhere along the line. We're already seeing it in some places. The euro is still having its own version of turmoil. It's going to have a lot more this year. So the dollar is going to be... Quote, a safe haven. As we discussed last year, Eric, it is not a safe haven, but it is perceived as a safe haven. And, and in fact, for some countries, it is a safe haven compared to, say, the euro or other, other currencies. So I still own the dollar. The fundamentals have only gotten worse, but the fundamentals have gotten everywhere, have gotten worse everywhere, uh, except maybe Russia. So I still own the U.S. dollar. Some people have suggested that the strength in the U.S. dollar could cause so many problems for emerging markets that we might eventually see something, let's call it like a Plaza Accord version 2.0, where governments around the world conspire to intentionally weaken the dollar to prevent or contain those adverse effects. Do you think that that's a possibility? Do you see that coming? And is that just something far out on the horizon or something that could happen soon? How do you see that? Uh, I've been around long enough to know that anything uh, is possible, no matter how weird it may sound. In fact, the weirder it sounds, the more likely it's probably going to happen. Uh, I, I doubt if it's going to be a plaza accord this time around. It's more likely this that the dollar is going to go higher and higher on its own volition for some of the reasons we discussed. It will get too high. So it, will, it will cause serious credit problems for some people because I've got a lot of people that borrowed a lot of dollars. It will also make many American companies less competitive. So the, it's going to go too high, may turn into a bubble, at which point I, I hope I'm smart enough to sell it because at some point market forces are going to cause the dollar to come back down because people are going to realize, oh, my gosh, this is 
causing a lot of turmoil, economic problems in the world, and it's damaging the American economy. At that point, the smart guys will get out. I hope I'm one of them. You said last year that you were long dollars and could easily see a bubble forming, but you went on to say that you could not imagine still owning dollars in 10 years' time. So now we're down to nine years. Do you still see that, that this has to come to an end? Do you see any signposts or any anything on the horizon that would tell us? You, you mentioned just a moment ago that you hope you're one of the guys who's smart enough to get out in time. What signals would you be looking for to tell you when the time is that the dollar rally is played out and you know the blow-off top is in or whatever it may be, and it's time to get on the other side of the trade? Well, if it turns into a bubble, all bubbles look the same, uh, no matter what country, what period of history, what, what assets, you know, everybody's screaming to buy it, they're screaming that it's different this time, you don't understand, you old man, you just don't, cannot understand why everybody needs to un, under own dollars. So the signs will always be there, uh, signs along the way will be some of the things I mentioned, you will start seeing bankruptcies by companies or countries that are extended, overextended in U.S. dollars, and since the dollar is going higher, they cannot repay their debts. You will see American companies and American balance of trade getting worse because of the high dollar. The signs will be pretty clear. They're, they're pretty simple signs. They've been around for hundreds of years, thousands of years. I just hope I'm smart enough to recognize them and have the insight to interpret them properly. We also spoke last year about the 35-year bond bull market. You emphasized that you didn't know for sure how long it could go on, but you said that it was certain to end sooner or later. In the year since we've spoke, quite a few industry luminaries have come out and declared that the 35-year secular bull market in bonds is over. Jeff Gunlick made that call to his credit almost on the very day that remains so far, at least, the bottom in yields and the top in price. Bill Gross has said that if we saw a 10-year Treasury move over 2.6% in yield, that would be the signal in his mind that says a secular bear market is underway. Ray Dalio has said that the credit cycle is played out. What you said last year was that you were short junk bonds, but you thought at that point a year ago it was too early to make a short call on treasuries. What's your take now? Is it time to go short U.S. treasuries, or is it still wait and see? Well, all those guys are smarter than I am, so I, I, I don't know. I, anyway, am not short bonds at the moment. Certainly would have been a good trade last summer, uh, as you pointed out. They, the bonds made a, uh, a high or interest rates made a low, long-term rates made a low. Uh, they have rallied since. But for my money, right now, as we speak, here in February of 2017, everybody is bullish on long-term U.S. government bonds. I've been around long enough, Eric, to know that when everybody is on the same side of the boat, I better run to the other side. So I am not shorting government bonds. I am short junk bonds still. If and when the mood changes and people are less skeptical, if bonds go down and everybody starts saying, oh, bonds cheated me, she lied to me, they lied, then I might be ready to short bonds again. Because we're certainly in the process of making a top. When that top comes, I don't know. I'm smart. I'm a very, very, very bad market timer, as you know. I'm a very, very bad short-term trader. So you should ask those other guys to get your timing. Let's come back to the junk bonds. You and I were both short junk last we spoke a year ago. I'm still holding that position today. It sounds like you are too. And it was quite profitable, actually, for a few months after we spoke. But since then, we've given back some profits. Is there room to think that maybe we stayed in the trade too long, or is this just a pullback? It, it's hard for me. You know, I, obviously, the recovery in energy prices has helped junk bonds, but I, I can't believe this is over yet. How do you see it? Well, I happen to agree with you 100%. Uh, the very fact that I'm still short junk bonds it means it's definitely you know, the timing is, is wrong. I uh, know in, when interest rates start going up again permanently, when the, when the bull market really does come to an end in interest rates, government bonds, interest rates are going to go very, very high, Eric, very high. If I told you how high, you would probably hang up now and not listen to me anymore. But, you know, in 1981, 
interest rates, short-term interest rates in America were over 20 percent. Bonds were yielding over – long-term bonds were yielding over 15 percent. We've had these long, long bull and bear markets in bonds in the United States, and we probably will again. So when interest rates go higher, the junk bonds are going to get destroyed both by interest rates and by credit defaults because many of them are, in fact, junk. <laughs> you know, the companies are not great credit risk, and they're going to they're gonna pay the price. I want to come back to that that whole point of interest rates going much higher. I couldn't agree more with you in terms of fundamentals that they should move higher, but I, I can't help but say, hey, wait a minute. In 1981, the U.S. was nowhere close to $20 trillion of national debt. And now that we are, it seems to me, if you were to go back to historically normal interest rates, even a 6% 10-year yield, never mind 20%, uh, how how could that happen without bankrupting the government because it can't service its debt? And what I'm trying to get my head around is if it can't happen, d does that mean that the interest rates can't go higher or does it mean they do go higher and the government can't service its debt and it leads to a major fiscal crisis? Do you think that when we get to the point where the natural market forces want to push interest rates higher, that governments will somehow contain them in order to keep their debts serviceable? Or do you think it means that governments are headed towards defaults and bankruptcy when we get to the point where interest rates return to their historical norms? I'm sorry, why do you think governments cannot go bankrupt? It's happened throughout history. The norm is for governments to go bankrupt over any extended periods of time, including the countries which are on top. After the First World War, 100 years ago, the UK was the richest, most powerful country in the world. There was no number two. Well, I can remember when the UK went bankrupt in the, in the night two generations later, three generations later. Could not sell long-term debt. The IMF had to bail them out. You're not old enough to remember when the French were like that or the Spanish or the Dutch. You know, everybody has been on top. Well, not everybody, but many people have been on top one time or another. They've all gone bankrupt. Why, why do you think people cannot go bankrupt? Oh, I don't think they can't go bankrupt. I guess what I don't see is there's no IMF to bail out the U.S. The U.S. is big enough that there is no entity to bail it out. So the bailout doesn't happen. Something else happens. And if the something else is a U.S. sovereign bond crisis, I mean, holy cow, Jim, U.S. Treasury bonds are pretty much the safe haven asset and the reserve central bank reserve asset of the entire globe. So if you have a crisis in you know unserviceable U.S. debt where the U.S. government cannot pay its bills, and that means that U.S. treasuries no longer have that safe haven value, what happens at that point? <laughs> well, Eric, uh, I su suggest that you uh, do a little more research, although I don't think you need to because you're you know, you're very knowledgeable, but if you do a lot of research and become knowledgeable about what's going on in the world, you're going to get very, very worried. And if you get very, very worried, you're going to, I hope, get prepared because we're going to have the worst economic problems we've had in your lifetime or my lifetime. And when that happens, a lot of people are going to disappear. You know, 19, I'm sorry, 2008. Bear Stearns disappeared. Bear Stearns had been around over 90 years. Lehman Brothers disappeared. Lehman Brothers had been around over 150 years. A long, long time, a long, glorious history. Been through wars, depression, civil war. They've been through everything, and yet they disappeared. So the next time around, it's going to be worse than anything we've seen, and a lot of institutions, people, companies, even countries, certainly governments and maybe even countries are going to disappear. I hope you get very worried. I am very worried, Jim, and you know it leads into my next question because you are such an astute student of history and you understand longer term trends. And I, I look at, you know, of course, Donald Trump has been elected president of the United States. The UK has voted to exit the European Union. There are movements underway which could lead to referenda in several other European countries that could lead to more countries abandoning the EU. So as a history student, Jim, what is this 
global rise in populism and rejection of government authority around the world telling us it almost feels like you know the we're, we're headed uh, down the road to revolution and, and things are about to come unglued am i am i exaggerating to think it's that bad well let's just talk about some of the things going to happen in the next couple of years and then i think we can draw further conclusions there are going to be more movements in Europe, for instance, to, for countries to split up and for countries to leave the EU. You mentioned the France before. Uh, there are people in France who want to split the country, there are people in Italy, Spain, Belgium who want to split those countries. They are now going to be encouraged by the fact that Brexit was successful. The Scots are going to have another election about the possibility of leaving the UK. Whether these things happen or not, uh, Eric, I, I don't know yet. I, I have views, but who cares? But we're certainly going to have the ongoing turmoil that these movements are alive and well and will be very active and vocal and visible for a while. Now, let's assume that some, or let's presume for a moment that some of them are successful. Well, if, if the European Union starts breaking up or the euro starts breaking up, that's going to throw a spanner in a lot of people's works because nobody's really sort of planned on that. Most of the bonds, the euro bonds, none of them, very few of them now, have any provision for what happens if there is no euro. I mean, Italy owns several billion dollars worth of bonds. Suppose Italy pulls out of the euro and they suddenly say, OK, we're going to pay you back in lira. Well, that's, that's going to confuse a lot of people and cause a lot more turmoil. You have the same sorts of movements in Asia, not nearly as powerful or as vocal yet, but you have the same sorts of – in the, in the United States, there's a movement now for California to withdraw from the U.S. And by the way, in the U.S., there are a lot of people who would like to see California leave the U.S. So it may work, it may work both ways. So when you start having bear markets, as you I'm sure well know, if one bad thing happens, then another bad thing happens, and these things snowball, just like in bull markets. Good news comes out, then more good news comes out. And the next thing you know, you're five or six or seven years into a bull market. Well, bear markets do the same thing, and so we have a lot of bad news on the horizon. I haven't even gotten to war. I haven't even gotten to trade war or anything like that, but, you know, things do go wrong. Well, that was my next question, is we spoke a year ago, ago about a topic that most people don't feel comfortable talking about, but I think you and I recognize that it's probably the most important question there is, which is history teaches us that when economic conditions are like they are now, usually it leads to war, either a trade war or a shooting war. And you were outspoken last year in saying that when you have an economic superpower of yesteryear that starts to become stagnant or even begins to decline, and, and you suggested that the U.S. had certainly started to become stagnant, if not in actual decline, that that has all, well, almost always led to war. So you went on to observe that it's easy to stir people up by blaming foreigners for all of our woes. Now, those probably sounded like crazy words to a lot of people last year, but look at where we are now a year later. We have an immigration ban against seven countries that seems to be heating up as one of the most contentious and heated both legal and political battles in U.S. history. So where do we stand in this big picture, Jim? Are we actually headed towards war? Does it start as a trade war or does it actually begin as a shooting war? What issues and events are on your radar screen in terms of important signposts that will tell us where this whole situation is headed? Well, as we discussed before... Whenever things are soft or bad and things are going wrong, people look for somebody to blame. They always, throughout history, wherever we are, which, whichever country we're discussing, the first people blamed are always the foreigners. They have different color skin, different languages, different religions, different food. They smell bad. Their food smells bad. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people talk about how, oh, those people, their food smells bad, and they smell bad too. So it's very easy. It's always happened that way to blame the foreigners for better or for worse. It seems it is happening, as you point out. 
in the U.S. again, but it's also happening in other places, Germany, France, Italy, many places. They're blaming the foreigners already again. Uh, it's even happening in Singapore to some extent where I live, nothing like, nothing like in Europe at the moment. And as you rile up against the foreigners, most countries historically have closed off one way or the other. They close their borders. They close their economies. And when you close the economy, it leads to economic problems. And sometimes eventually, if you get into real serious trade wars, it leads to bankruptcy and even and even worse. You know, uh, it's rare. I don't think ever in history that one country has started a trade war and the other country says, oh, well, that's too bad. But we're not going to do anything. We're just going to sit here and let you hit us again and again and again. No, the other countries retaliate. That's the way human beings are. So if country X starts a trade war, then country Y hits back. And then country X hits back and country Y hits back. And the next thing you know, country C and D and E are involved as well. And everybody's suffering. And then as economies get worse, more and more things happen. More and more discrimination, more and more blame. And then eventually bullets start flying. So, no, I, I don't like at all what I see happening. It's, there are many analogies that to previous periods in history. Before the First World War, this sort of thing started happening. And certainly before the Second World War, this sort of thing started happening. Uh, it's been it's been common throughout history and these wars you know when they start they usually in, in 1914 nobody nobody could conceive of war and then the next thing you knew there was war and everybody said don't worry it'll be over by christmas well six months later everybody was saying how do we get into this war how do we get out of this war it's absurd it's ludicrous etc and that's been the case for many Many, most wars, if you go back and look, some bureaucrat throws his weight around. The next thing you know, another bureaucrat throws his weight around. And the next thing you know, 20-year-old kids are shooting at each other instead of drinking beer together. And everybody's suffering. So, no, that, am I worried? I'm very worried. And, and I know enough history to know that these things have often, often led to real war. Certainly, you know, we just had a president who won the Nobel Peace Prize, of all things. Well, he started more wars probably than most presidents in American history. Uh, America seems to have a, a penchant for war, and they seem to like to get involved. Well, that certainly is true. On a related note to that, let's talk for a minute about U.S.-Russian relationships. The Democrats would have us believe that Donald Trump did not win the election, but actually evil Russian agents hacked the election and undermined American democracy, effectively throwing the election to Donald Trump. Nancy Pelosi even demanded just this past week that the FBI should launch a major investigation to figure out what information the Russians are holding on Donald Trump in order to blackmail him into bowing to their wishes. President Trump, on the other hand, continues to reiterate that he has no ties to Russia, no business deals in Russia, no personal relationships with the Russian government, never talked to Putin, doesn't know Putin, and so on and so forth. And he's been particularly outspoken in saying that getting along with Russia is a good thing, not a bad thing, that America should strive to get along with Russia, that he hopes to get along with Putin, even though he says that he doesn't know him. And President Trump has suggested that it is the Democrats who are trying to start World War III with all of their anti-Russian rhetoric and accusations. Now, you're the history and world affairs guru, Jim. Are the Russians really the bad guys here, or are they being scapegoated in order to facilitate an American political rhetoric campaign against the president? Well, I do know that uh, during the last administration, uh, Mr. Obama's administration, as you probably remember uh, we started we tried to pull off an illegal coup in the in Ukraine you know we we got caught at it uh, what's her name uh, Victoria Lundgren whatever the woman's name in the State Department they, they, there are several uh, pieces of evidence where we know she tried to instigate an illegal coup then of course the Russians outsmarted us and so the State Department started blaming it on the Russians and the hype against the Russians has gotten bigger and bigger ever since. 
after we started the or tried to start tried to instigate the illegal coup in in Crimea and Ukraine. So yes, we 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 are certainly at, at fault to some extent, and obviously you then when you're caught you got to keep the rhetoric up and keep throwing more and more accusations. And so the State Department has done that. Uh, I know that before that illegal coup, uh, Obama, Bush, everybody was trying to be friends with the Russians, rightly so. The Cold War had ended long ago. The Russians wanted to be friends with America. Uh, we didn't need NATO anymore. Who needed the Cold War, et cetera? All the money we were spending on 